Good morning. It's Sunday, December 1st, and this is The Georgia Gang. I'm Russ Spencer, in for Lori Geary. It's official. The federal cases against President-elect Trump are over for now and probably forever. Marjorie Taylor Greene will lead a new House subcommittee working with Elon Musk and Vivek Ramaswamy on cutting government waste, the Department of Government Efficiency, or DOGE. And it looks like Rivian might build its new EV plant in Georgia after all, a project that promises 7,500 jobs. Uh, Kathy, Phil, Theron, and Martha are here. The debate and discussion begin right now. From the Fox 5 studios, the Georgia gang starts now. Well, special counsel Jack Smith didn't wait for Donald Trump to follow through on his promise to fire him. He asked a judge this week to toss the federal indictments against the president-elect. Not, he says, because the evidence against him wasn't compelling, but because Trump won and rules are rules. More than a year after the president-elect was federally indicted for allegedly trying to subvert the 2020 election, special counsel Jack Smith wrote to the judge, this case should be dismissed before the defendant is inaugurated. It made this election the largest effective jury verdict in history uh, by reelecting Donald Trump. Uh, the, the special counsel found himself at odds with his own department's longstanding policy against the prosecution of a sitting president. President-elect Trump reacted on his social media platform, I persevered against all odds and won. Smith also asked a judge to dismiss Trump's Florida classified documents case. Both cases were impacted by a recent Supreme Court decision granting a president broad immunity for official acts in office. Uh, the immunity Mr. Trump enjoys does not apply to Rudy Giuliani, John Eastman, Mark Meadows, or the other defendants in the Fulton County case, which is still in limbo while the Georgia Court of Appeals decides whether Fonnie Willis can stay on as the prosecutor. Now, I know you folks have been over this ground, similar ground before, but now it's official. Uh, was justice done, Martha? And, and what does this mean for the Georgia case, in your opinion? Well, and of course, the immunity didn't extend to him in the Georgia case either. It was just right. federal cases, so yep. you don't know what's going to happen. But I think it's going to go away uh, ultimately um, because of a lot of different factors. It's kind of been in a house of cards so far. Uh, but is but the other people that you mentioned that have already pled, of course, have you know a different situation because they're not the president. Now they still have appellate avenues because really what we forget about all of this is until all resources have been uh, exhausted, just like in the case in New York. I mean, yes, the president's been the president elect has been convicted, but he's still got appeals. He's still got things to do. So the legal system's not over. Okay. Do you think justice was done in this case? Well, I think it was really, um, you hear a lot of Democrats saying, Russ, is that we will never know uh, what would have happened had he not become president. Um, you know, there are Democrats out there saying now that he still needs to be held accountable for his role in these federal charges and what not only happened in January 6th, but these are some very serious federal charges. However, election has consequences. And the fact that he won, um, now the way based on how our U.S. Constitution is written, our federal policies, this president is protected with a certain amount of immunity um, because he will be the next president. The last thing I want to say is that um, Jack Hill actually made the right decision because I think he's got to have a, a political and professional life after this election and, and this transfer of power. So him not allowing President-elect Trump to fire him and him doing what he may be perceived as doing the right thing will actually make him more employable going forward. Yeah, and Smith made it clear, Phil, that uh, the Jackson, this, Smith, yeah, sorry, this was not a consequence of the, there not being enough evidence. It's just the, the, the rules of uh, not prosecuting a sitting president. Well, he's going to say that. The Supreme Court did the right thing, and uh, this is a typical example of lawfare, which this country cannot have. I don't want Republican prosecutors colluding to try to destroy their political enemies either, and that was the, the, the genie that was coming out of the bottle. And so it was a waste of over $75 million. Uh, Jack Smith was working with a left-wing judge. Um, I'm glad that this is over with. Uh, nothing was done when it came to documents by Joe Biden, uh, for example, or Hillary Clinton. Uh, that was ignored by the Democrats and the Biden Justice Department, as we all know. So um, I think it's it's good as for, as for Georgia. I, I agree with Martha. I think all of this is going to be collapsing. Well, uh, and a real quick point before Kathy is that it also was ignored by the Trump Justice Department. You know, he made a choice not to go after his political opponents in the last term. So we'll see what happens. What do you make of this lawfare argument, Kathy? 
I don't even know what a lawfare is. Is what I want to say is justice this wasn't whole, done. This weaponizing you know what it is. is. Well, okay, that, that's thanks. the accusation. Yeah, um, I wasn't up on the lingo. But first, let me just say justice wasn't done. But rules are rules, as Jack Smith said. You know that he has immunity. He gets it. You know, he won the big prize, but I don't think the other people should be let off. I think we have to go through the process and determine what happened. And, um, you know, there's so much obfuscation going on, but as far as I'm concerned, until it's over, it ain't over. Okay. Let's talk about Marjorie Taylor Greene. She's been tapped uh, to lead a subcommittee on, on House oversight, uh, working with Elon Musk and Vivek Ramaswamy to fire people in the federal government who they think need firing. In interviews this week, she has threatened to defund public broadcasting, sanctuary cities, toilets in Africa, anything that doesn't really benefit Americans is the point. Musk is talking about slashing half a trillion dollars. You know, I've talked to a lot of Republicans who love this idea of slashing government waste and wonder whether she's the, the serious person to deal with this. Phil, what do you think? Oh, I think she's going to be fine. She's working uh, in, in conjunction with uh, Senator Joni Ernst, who's uh, her counterpart in the Senate. She's working, uh, as you point out, with uh, Vivek Ramaswamy and, of course, Elon Musk. Uh, it's a big project with, with a lot of cogs in the wheel. Uh, this is going to be probably one of his first executive orders as President of the United States uh, uh, when Trump signs uh, this. In, I think they I hope they go for a trillion dollars. Uh, you mentioned some cuts. Those are small ones, yes. But, I mean, just think about uh, abolishing the Department of Education, which has been a goal by a lot of leaders on the center political right for, for decades. Uh, think about uh, just slashing billions of dollars out of government waste and abuse, which even a lot of Democrats have cited in the past, but nothing has ever happened the last four years. So I think it's an exciting time. I, I don't have a problem with Marjorie Taylor Greene or anybody working on this. Darren, do you have any concerns about Medicare, Medicaid, defense spending, um, all that sort of thing? Absolutely. Medicaid, Medicare, Social Security, and then NPR. Come on, Russ. I mean, NPR, National Public Radio, is a radio uh, station <laughs> in, in a platform that many people in this country depend on, right? And it's $500 million total spending uh, yeah. across the country. Let them so be funded by grants there. And so, um, you know, this is very reminiscent of what we were told that Project 2025 had a lot of these things in it. However, however, there's been a disconnect, but let's talk about the loyalty that's being rewarded here. Um, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene was a staunch supporter of this president-elect. And she is being assigned, Russ, what I believe, and Phil just said it, it's his words, not mine, which will be one of the first orders of business for this president-elect, is to go in and to basically cut this government spending. But it's to really fulfill a promise that he campaigned on. And so what better person than this congresswoman who's been having this unwavering loyalty to him? And she, by the way, stuck with him when it looks like he was out, when it looks like he was never going to be a uh, candidate again. It looks like you know people had turned on him. Marjorie Taylor Greene stuck with this president so she now has the task of doing what my friend said on the right here not me to go in and basically disrupt and to cut a lot of good programs uh, from our federal government I saw you react to I his know, mention of know, 2025 it's, it's it's a that's a that's just the words that Democrats use it has nothing to do with this process but one of the things I think is so interesting about this is that the head of NPR just said this week that she doesn't care about the truth you know that it's about the certain right things that you want to get forward. I don't think that helps you when you're in this discussion, but again, this is not the first time this has been mentioned. All these programs have been mentioned before. If Martha Zoller was in charge of this, what I would do is start with the 50 to 100,000 openings that there are in the federal government right now, and I would zero those out like Sonny Perdue did when he was having troubles with the budget. That would save about $500 billion right off the bat, and you would reorganize departments, and you can't do an interview of somebody that's been fired. That would be what I would start with. Yeah, but I think I think the many viewers here support me. NPR is a valuable program. I don't think you dispute that. But what I'm saying to you is, is that there is camp, there's consequences to elections, and I'm not being critical of the congresswoman. I'm saying that she actually is being given a pretty big assignment. It's a huge assignment. It's a huge yeah. assignment based on her loyalty to this president. But to say that you know this country should not be worried about Medicaid cuts, Medicare cuts, Social Security. I have an 80 year old mother. I don't, you know, I don't know if your parents or your parents are living, but I care. I think about my mother 
who lives on this fixed income every single month to be able to survive. Trump has pledged he won't cut Social Security and Medicare. Come on, now you know that. I got to get in here. I've just been waiting my turn. I know, exactly. We want to know what Kathy thinks about this. And I'm interested, while you're talking about this, what do you think about potential conflicts of interest for Elon Musk and Vivek Ramaswamy, who have business with the federal government? Well, they shouldn't that. That's a giant question. Let me just say this first about Marjorie Taylor Greene. I don't think she knows anything about government. And the fact that this would be her list, I know it's for polling and to get people all jacked up, but I don't think she has a, a real appreciation of the nuances of what we do in this country because she's so busy trying to burn it down. So I'll start with that. Secondly, I heard uh, today on the news that um, Elon Musk on, on X had revealed the names of four government employees that he thought should be fired personally, by name. And, and this is the kind of thing we cannot get into. It's dangerous for people. It, it, it demonizes people. And it doesn't, it, 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 you know, I'll go with Martha's uh, zero at the empty positions and we'll start with that. But um, yeah, I think, you know, n naming this committee Doge, I think is a huge conflict of interest. I think when you have people, you know, who are gonna be redirecting how dollars get spent and then get government contracts, um, it's, a, it's a serious conflict of interest and it's not the way I, we ought to go about it. All right, we're out of time for this segment, thank you. Uh, coming up, a growing criticism over how both of Georgia's U.S. Senators voted to rein in Israel and Rivian, a one step closer to building its EVs in Georgia. We'll be right back. Have a question or comment for the Georgia Gang? Email them at georgiagang at foxtv.com. Criticism is growing of Senator John Ossoff's support of a failed vote to limit arms sales to Israel over the deaths of innocent civilians in Gaza. The measures were sponsored by Bernie Sanders, and more than a dozen Democratic senators voted for them, including Senator Warnock. Now, last week, the Israeli Consul General in Atlanta wrote to Senator Ossoff, Expressing your criticism of Israel and allied democracy by voting against it on a core national security interest during an existential war is deeply concerning. If protecting innocent lives is your priority, I urge you to focus on demanding Hamas to release the 101 remaining hostages, including seven American citizens, and lay down their arms. This is the surest way to spare innocent lives on both sides. Kathy, I'll give you a chance to react to this first. What do you well, think? Well, first thing is, it's clear John Ossoff is running for uh, elected office because he's in the news just about every week now, so we'll probably have a lot of discussions about his positions. But I think it was an interesting vote for him, and I think it was an interesting vote for the Senate to take. I think we have to acknowledge the incredible loss of life as a result of this war, of, of, of civilian life, of, of women and children and people who are not combatants, and I think it's time we talk. I think Netanyahu has flexed his power and has slapped the U.S. around time and time again when we've talked about trying to reach a peace deal that would get the hostages back. And I think it's time we have some different points of view. I'm glad he did it. Phil, in his floor speech about this, he invoked Ronald Reagan in 1982, uh, voting to limit uh, sales of uh, munitions to uh, cluster bomb munitions, I think it was, to Israel, uh, to try to influence its, its behavior. And apparently it worked in that case. Well, I heard a soft speech talking about the Marine barracks bombing in 1982. It has nothing to do with the situation at all. We're talking about uh, weapons sales. In fact, they were tank shells and mortar shells. These were just two votes. I want to commend the majority of Democrats that voted with all Republicans to give these weapons to Israel because their arsenals obviously are running low. They were attacked, for heaven's sake, and they're responding. It is sad, and I, I uh, I believe in different points of view. Israel is not above criticism, obviously, but I think when it comes to weapon sales to our major U.S. ally in the Mideast, uh, it was a, a foolish vote. It, it undermines uh, what Israel is trying to do. We just had a peace deal that Netanyahu did uh, with uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, and, and that was a good thing. So we're, I think Trump will try to work for a peace deal when he gets elected. But for Ossoff and for Warnock to just undercut our main ally, you could see a lot of the Jewish groups were outraged right. here in Georgia. No, it's very true. But there was a lot of posturing this week. Bombs exchanged, you know, heavy, heavy uh, air fire, these kinds of discussions. 
New York Times editorial about injuries in Gaza. You know, it's all part of the mix of trying to get to a ceasefire. How, how nervous is John Ossoff of the fact that Donald Trump won Georgia by 120,000 votes? Um, I think he's very nervous. And you look at, to Kathy's point, he's been trying to figure out who's going to lead the Democratic Party of Georgia. He's injected himself in that. He's also been trying to build coalitions across the state, finding some bipartisan opportunities uh, to work with different counties. He's been spending time in rural counties. Um, he's also been trying to help out the airport to get them funding. But Russ, I'm so glad you mentioned his speech because I went back and listened to his speech in its totality. He also mentioned in his speech that um, he has been a, a, a key supporter of the Jewish community. He, he, he referred to them as our number one ally, but he did talk about the 1982, but he also said that nobody should receive weapons um, to go and to um, participate in this war without any oversight. There needs to be some type of conditions in place. But I would tell you the flip side of that is I agree with Phil. The Jewish community, Russ, is outraged about this. I can't tell you how many calls, how many letters I've heard. I mean, a lot of the friends, and this is very hard for me because I support Senator also, but there are a lot of Jewish people who are demanding answers. Uh, they're going to continue to call him and try to make him explain why he did what he did. And this, there were other Democrats that did it, but I think it's a lot of unfair criticism to John Also, The question is, and not so much fundamentally why he made the vote, but politically, how does it affect him? And I think to Kathy's point, um, he did raise a lot of good points in his, in his remarks, but for him and bo for both senators to make this vote and to uh, know that we have a very fragile Democratic coalition right now, uh, it would definitely be a political you know talks going forward from this point on Martha what's your take so I've worn this Star of David with a cross in it since October 8th because I'm a 65 year old woman so I can't fight for the hostages myself mm -hmm. but we are none of us have mentioned that is what started this was the hostages being taken and, a, and an attack mm -hmm. that was barbaric 1200 in people murdered yes mm -hmm. and um, I think that I disagree about limits being put on weapons. If we're gonna get involved in a war, victory ought to be the goal. And victory means annihilating your enemy. It's not pretty, it's not nice, and war is never good, okay? But if you're gonna get involved, you have to do that. And I think that he made himself look like, and this is hard for me to say because I like him a lot, the AJC called John Ossoff and I the most unusual bro bromance or, or you know romance in politics because I like him a lot, but I feel like he sided with the terrorists by doing that. And I'm glad that they lost and I'm glad they lost badly in that vote because the right thing was done by the vote going being put down. Okay, let's change the subject. We, I only have a minute and a half or so for, for this, but let's talk about Rivian. They apparently have now qualified for a $6 billion loan from the Energy Department. Looks like this is going to happen. Anybody surprised? Did, did you think that perhaps this was not going to happen, Phil? What do you think? I was surprised. Um, they, the company has never made a profit, right. and um, EV car sales, as we all know, it's a national controversy. Um, how's it going to go? We, do we have the infrastructure is the big question right now. Uh, it's a great investment um, for Georgia. Um, I'm not sure the government should play winners and losers. You could argue that. And when Trump comes in, he's already said that he's going to remove the uh, the tax break for uh, purchasing EV vehicles, which isn't going to help the industry much. So I think it's a big question mark. Rivian says they're going to start building uh, cars here in 2028, 7,500 jobs. Is that a big deal? It is a big deal, especially in rural areas. I, you know, I wonder about that. Let me just say right off the bat, I think those trucks are really sweet. I'd love to have one. But <laughs> They're good looking. I, I, I don't have a hundred thousand dollars for a pickup truck, no. but, but, but I do think, you know, one has to question how many subsidies a company gets before they're profitable and before, you know, it's it's a good deal uh, for government. And I'm I'm not sure about this one. All right, I'm out of time on this segment. Uh, coming up, uh, the priorities for the next year's legislative session, and we mourn the passing of. Georgia's Labor Commission when we come back. Join the discussion on the Georgia Gang Facebook page and watch past episodes on the Georgia Gang YouTube channel. Well, the start of the Georgia legislative session is now 43 days away. The state finds itself in strong shape financially with $16.5 billion in the bank, $11.5 billion in undesignated reserves, and $5.5 billion in rainy day funds. So the question, Martha, what, what are the priorities as far as you're concerned? 
I think, and the point needs to be made, the last three months, the revenues have been a little bit down compared to last year. So I'm not saying we're in a problem or recession, but I think it's going to be a more conservative approach to what mm -hmm. the budget is. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think that, you know, I think that the governor is not going to look like a lame duck governor. I think he's going to look like a governor that has a future ahead of him. And Running I for president, maybe? <laughs> I don't know. Or Senate. Yeah, <laughs> we right. could have that. But as far as, you know, the budget, the budget, I'm always concerned about women's health care. I'm always concerned about, you know, how we're going to get the funding to the st state health clinics that we have all around the state and mental health funding. But I'm willing to wait and see what the budget looks like. I, de I definitely agree with Martha. I think it's health care. I think it's restoring hospitals, keeping hospitals open. Mm -hmm. You know, we need more money for public education and we need more money for housing. Um, you know, you hear so many people talk about how they are working class Georgians who cannot afford to live in good areas. And so you've heard Republicans speak last year about workforce housing, close to a lot of these plants that we've been talking about. And the other thing I think we can really invest in, Russ, is that we really got it. I'm going to keep saying this. I keep saying this. We got the week. We got to do something about responsible gun ownership in this state. All right. We still just had a mass shooting not long ago at Appalachian High School with million, I mean, what, millions of people in this country suffer from mental illness, but we also have a gun problem in this in this state. And then lastly, I think that there's an easy target, and, and Kathy, I'm so glad she mentioned this last week, this issue around maternal mortality, uh, we cannot let that go under the rug. We, you, you brought it up last week about a committee being fired. We got too many women of color who are dying in this state, and we need to put more funding, more research towards preventing those deaths. Well, I agree with what uh, a lot of my colleagues are saying is, is priorities. We could probably spend 10 minutes because a lot of us uh, have them. In fact, Theron, to your point, uh, I want to see that school security program really boosted uh, a lot of these rural schools, as we know. Uh, and yes, your, your point, uh, uh, I have to agree with, these are great priorities that they need to be uh, discussing. All right, Kathy, Well, let me put a fine point on it. it. We've got to expand Medicaid. Yeah. You know, we've mm -hmm. got to expand Medicaid. If you, if you care about maternal mortality, yeah. if you care about restoring rural hospitals in particular, the solution is this. We're going to pay $580 million in the first year and get $1.2 billion back in federal funds. Now, you know, Trump may get rid of it, but, you know, we've lost a decade of not getting that funding, and, and it shows in the state. And so the, for the bang for the buck, uh, if the governor really wants to do something, quit fooling around with the terms of it and expand Medicaid. But I, I don't see any hint that he's thinking about giving up this Georgia Pathways, do you? Well, you know, again, if he wants to run for something in the future, he's got a mess on his hands and he needs to think about getting rid of it and go on and do this. And I think there's plenty of reasons that he can kind of cover up the fact that that program is an absolute failure uh, and, and really move toward doing something about maternal mortality. All right. Uh, Georgia is mourning the passing of Labor Commissioner Bruce Thompson. Mr. Thompson uh, died last Sunday after an eight-month battle with late-stage pancreatic cancer, just 59 years old. A serial entrepreneur, he called himself. He was a member of the state Senate, Army National Guard vet from uh, Montana at one point in his life. Phil, uh, it's a, it's a shocker to see someone uh, pass way too early this it, way. It was a shocker, Russ, and um, we became friends in recent years. Uh, he took over the Labor Department, and it was uh, mismanaged. Um, he got rid of a lot of the uh, top brass there and put in some really good people. He, Bruce Thompson was a man of integrity, mm -hmm. and he'll be missed. Sorry. I agree with Phil. I didn't know him as well as you did, Phil. And Martha, I know you probably spent some time with him. But, you know, some of my most vivid memories of the, uh, when he was a state senator, uh, I remember going to him and lobbying him about Microsoft. And he took a trip out to Redmond. He was like, I wanted to see this firsthand. He stepped up and had a very, very tough uh, race for labor commissioner. And now I tell people one of my most proud jobs that I had is when I worked at the labor commissioner's office because what those folks do every day from women and men in Georgia uh, is, is so valuable. But uh, everybody you talk to, even on the Democratic side, Republican mm -hmm. side, you knew what you were going to get with Bruce Thompson. He would tell you where he was, and he was a really good listener. Um, when you go, you would lobby him and go to him for support. You had to have all your facts in order. So he's going to be missed, and I send my condolences to his family. Mar yeah, so I first met Bruce. I moderated a panel when he was first running for office, and so he had a contested race, and so I got to know him then. And of course, he went on to win the race, and I worked with him on a number of issues when I was the interim executive director for Georgia Life Alliance. He helped us with some some bills that we got passed, the Betsy's Law, which provides uh, 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 pregnancy care homes for women, which mm -hmm. is a great great thing. And um, and he was just such a fighter. You know, I've 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 lost my mom and my dad and my sister to cancer, and so 
so and my husband's a cancer survivor so I have a I talked to him a lot through through his cancer journey and um, you know he was a fighter he, and I'm sure he was a fighter right to the end but he's also was a child of God and I know where he is there you go May he rest in peace. Our condolences to, to his family. And we'll be right back with Winners and Losers next. Time now for the week's winners and losers. So do we do losers on Thanksgiving week? I don't know. Kathy, that's up to you. I don't have any losers on Thanksgiving week. Um, of course, we're doing this early, so we don't know who won the Georgia-Georgia Tech game. So right. whoever lost that is clearly the loser, and I hope it's not the dogs. Um, I want to say the winners are um, are the election workers of Georgia. You know, the Secretary of State uh, did a, a special audit and found less than 100 discrepancies out of over 5 million votes cast. I think that's remarkable. We have thousands and thousands of volunteers who who, who held this uh, this recent election and it just it just went well so um, it's a relief isn't th it those are the winners <laughs> and it is a huge relief all right Phil well Joe Tanner who was Georgia's first uh, Department of Natural Resources Commissioner died the other day he was a great Georgian uh, he was also a lobbyist highly respected yeah. on both sides of the aisle and uh, my loser is the um, mainstream corporate media, especially in this last campaign season. Um, I think you have a new alternative media, which is going to be a winner, uh, podcasts, uh, streaming, uh, I think both parties are going to be embracing that even more. So, uh, And the AJC is a real loser. They were so biased in this campaign. Unbelievable. Um, I hope everyone had a happy Thanksgiving. I'm so thankful for my family and the team that I work with over at Paramount Consulting Group. So the ladies there, thank you so much. Also, have a few shout outs for us. Rose, Muscati, Keisha Wilson, Errol Wilson, I didn't forget you. Uh, thank you for watching the show. And then thank you to the airport workers as you guys are enduring a busy weekend at the airport. <laughs> I hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving, <laughs> yeah. and I also wanted to remember Joe Tanner. Um, he was a fine servant of the state of Georgia. But I also remember some super watchers, Georgia gang watchers, Rhett and Gung Yu Prince, are great watchers of the program. They love the program, but they don't like my hair. But that's okay. We're going to work on it. I think you look great. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for you watching. I'm thankful that uh, Lori will be. Look at that hair. It's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, happy Thanksgiving. Uh, How's my hair, Russ? <laughs> uh, yeah. Flawless. You look, you look great. Flawless. <laughs> <laughs> Lori will be back next week. <laughs>